Welcome to my channel. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll continue my conversation of Franco Berardi's The Soul at Work, the introduction to the book, and this is the second part of my discussion of the introduction. Now, in the first part, we already talked about how Berardi talks about the soul being incorporated in the work. And in this part of the introduction, he basically gives us an outline of the book as to what does he plan to tackle in the book. In the first part, I also talked about the workerist Marxism and compositionist Marxism. And if you are interested, there is an individual brief video which discusses compositionist Marxism, and it's important to watch that. But as we read the book further, you will see that Berardi, of course, discusses compositionist Marxism within the body of the book as well. So as we followed in the previous discussions, I will go and read passages of the book and then come back and briefly talk about it. So let's see what he has to say about the book itself in part two of the introduction. This book I will examine anew the Marxist language which was dominant in the 1960s, trying to reestablish its vitality with respect to the languages of post-structuralism, schizoanalysis, and cyber culture. Despite the fact that the term soul is never used in the language of that historical period, I want to use it metaphorically and even a bit ironically in order to rethink the core of many questions referring to the issue of alienation. In the Hegelian vision, this issue is defined by the relationship between humans' essence and activity, while in the materialistic vision of Italian workerism, oprismo, alienation is defined as the relationship between human time and capitalist value, that is to say, as the reification of both body and soul. In the Hegelian Marxist tradition of the 20th century, the concept of alienation refers specifically to the relation existing between corporeality and human essence. For Hegel, the word alienation refers to the self of becoming other, to the historical and mundane separation existing between the being and the existing. So I'm not going to go in much detail here because these concepts will be discussed in the subsequent chapters. But here are some of the things that we should take from this passage. First of all, he's reminding us that he is discussing the soul metaphorically, but also ironically to see how the soul is incorporated within the project of capital. And then he's also telling us that one concept that he will deal with in great detail is alienation, right? Now, we understand alienation in different ways, right? So when he mentions Hegel, that is the self alienated from itself, right? And how does it, does it discover itself and restore itself to its essential self? That's the project in Hegel. Now, remember that famous master-slave dialectic in which the master is the one who is aware of his or his self, right? And the slave is not. And the, the relationship between the two is when the body of one is appropriated by the other, but it's within the process of that appropriation that the slave learns of his own essence through works, right? And reconciles it, right? And has a chance to alter his self. So people have used a lot of that. Then he goes into the workerist 1960s workerist definition of the alienation, and that is the alienation of the body and of the souls of the workers from the project of capital itself, from working within it and the reification, right, of work or of body. Reification, remember, is when something material is reduced to the level of an abstract value, right? And then he gives us the, the traditional Marxian idea of alienation, and that is the alienation from work itself, right? So the traditional ideal of Marxian idea of alienation is that it posits an essence, that we all have a human essence, 
right? But we are alienated from it, from the things that we produce as workers, because what we are doing is not re reconciled with who we actually are, and the purpose of disalienation then is to reconcile the worker with what they would like to do, what they love to do, right? So relationship is to the social and to the mode of production. These are the three uh, ways of alienation that he's talking about. But we already know that he is going to discuss alienation in the book and then also juxtapose it with its competing concept, which is usually kind of conflated with alienation, and that is estrangement. Estrangement from self, estrangement from work, estrangement from the capitalistic mode of production. One claim of this book is to actually recuperate the concept of estrangement to re-theorize rights of workers and their relationship with capital of their bodies and their souls. So keep these two concepts in mind. Let's read a little more, and then I'll come back and talk about it. In Marx, the concept of alienation signifies the split between life and labor, the split between the workers' physical activity and their humanity, their essence as humans. Young Marx, the author of the 1844 manuscripts, who was the main reference for the radical philosophy of the 1960s, attributes a pivotal role to the notion of alienation. In Marx's parallels, as in Hegel before, alienation and estrangement are two terms that define the same process from two different standpoints. The first one defines the sense of loss felt by consciousness when faced with an object in the context of capital's domination. The second term refers to the confrontation between the consciousness and the scene of exteriority and to the creation of an autonomous consciousness based on the refusal of its own dependence on work. Italian workerist thought overturned the vision of Marxism that was dominant in those years. The working class is no longer conceived as a passive object of alienation, but instead as the active subject of a refusal capable of building a community starting out from its estrangement from the interests of capitalistic society. Alienation is then considered not as the loss of human authenticity, but as estrangement from capitalistic interest, and therefore as a necessary condition for the construction in a space estranged from the hostile to labor relations of an ultimately human relationship. In the context of French post-structuralism, a similar overturning of the traditional vision of clinical alienation was finding its way. Schizophrenia, considered by psychiatry only as the separation and loss of self-consciousness, is rethought by Felix Guattari in totally new terms. Schizophrenia is not the passive effect of a scission of consciousness, but rather a form of consciousness that is multiple, proliferating, and nomadic. In this book, I want to compare the conceptual framework of the 60s based on the Hegelian concepts of alienation and totalization to the conceptual framework of our present, which is based on the concepts of biopolitics and of psychopathologies of desire. So there are quite a few interesting and important things that we learn in these passages. First of all is the distinction between alienation and estrangement, and that's very crucial for us to understand, both coming from Hegel but also from young Marx. And if I read the sentence carefully when he describes alienation, the first one is to define the sense of loss felt by consciousness when faced with an object in the context of capital's domination. That's alienation. And in Marx, that alienation is alienation from the products of your labor. So any commodities that you make, since that process, you're doing it to get a paycheck, right? So you're not reconciled with what you're making. So that is 
what is called alienation in Marx. Estrangement, right, a relative term, but estrangement, a sense of loss felt by consciousness when faced with an object in the capitals of uh, context of capital's domination, that's alienation. And estrangement refers to the confrontation between the consciousness and the scene of exteriority, right? When a consciousness reaches out into the world, which is the mode of production, and then draws away from it, right? Feels estranged from it, right? And that is because the consciousness realizes that in order to sub subsist or exist in this exteriority called the capital, there is a necessity to work, right? And what he's then saying in the next paragraph that I read is that the 60s workerist Marxist reverse this relationship. So instead of thinking of labor as alienated or estranged as passive recipient of power of the dictates of capital, what they say is that that estrangement expresses itself in the 16 movements of walking away from work, withholding work, right, or refusal to work. And by doing that, what the workers then were able to suggest and actually practice is that it's labor with its actions that forces capital to reconfigure itself, to change itself, and not capitalism that forces labor to become a certain way. So that's the very big reversal here, right, that he's talking about. But then building on that, what he's also saying is that while, while this is happening in Marxist thought in the 60s, another new wave, right, of clinical alienation and its definition and discussion is also emerging from the French side. And that is reconfiguring of desire, but also theorization of, let's say, schizophrenia, which was traditionally thought as not being able to conform to the standard mode and as a debilitating, debilitating condition. And what he's saying is after Felix Guattari and, of course, Deleuze are done with it, we realize that schizoanalysis and schizophrenia is not an ailment, but it's a multiplicity. It's the power to inhabit more than one personalities, power to inhabit more than one subjectivities that gives birth to the ideas of nomadism, the ideas of, uh, you know, endless possibilities for workers and everyone else. And so hence what he's saying is I'm pulling this strand from Marx and Hegel about alienation and estrangement, but I'm pulling some strands from the French post-structuralist thought as, as well, especially the one in clinical psychology and their theorization of the schiz, right? The schizoid subject and its possibilities. And these two he's bringing together, right? And then there are two instructive terms in these passages where he's talking about biopolitics and psychopathologies of desire. Now, we all know that biopolitics, of course, is, is a Foucauldian term, right? When power, right, creates systems in which we think of the system not as a death-giving system, but as a life-giving system, and then within the larger structure of what Foucault calls governmentality, how a certain kind of biopolitics is an introduced, a politics of life, right, and then regulating that life. And psychopathologies of desire, right, that is a clear reference to Deleuze and Guattari's work. So what we are learning here is that while he is drawing from early Marx and Hegel to discuss estrangement and alienation, which will be discussed in detail in the book, he's in, f and the 60s workerist upheaval, right, and, and reconfiguring of Marx and the question of estrangement and alienation. And estrangement being the more important in instructive terms because it's the estrangement from work that drives the walk away from work, right? 
but he's infusing that also with the latest advances in the theorization of desire and how it plays a role in his work, right? And biopolitics, how are bodies and life configured within the structure of power? Now, the reason is pretty simple, okay? He's going to talk to us as to how the soul is incorporated within the project of capital. Why? How does soul come to work, right? And soul, remember, is the expression of the body. What the body does is its soul, right? And in order to articulate that in the current moment of capital, what he's then trying to say is that I'm going to deal with capital as it exists, and it's not just material labor, and it's not just bodies working. It's our desires, our consciousness at work, but also estranged, right? How to harness that? And in order to do that, simple Marxian thought is not going to do. So he's going to bring other strands, which usually most Marxists won't be receptive to, I mean, bringing in post-structuralist thought. So psychopathologies of desire coming from Deleuze and Guattari, right? Biopolitics, coming from Foucault, and as we go and read a little more, we'll realize that Baudelaire is going to be there too, and his theorization of reality and hyperreal. So what Berardi is mobilizing here is bodies of knowledge from disparate groups, right? That split between what happens to the mind and what happens to the body, and the Marxist emphasis on the body and its materiality what he's saying is, I'm going to bring the psyche in it too, but then I'm also going to bring in desire, how that works, and how all of that combined then incorporates the consciousness in the work of capital, right? That is the soul at work. So this is what these passages that I've just read tell us. And then he's going to tell us what he's going to do in the chapters that follow in the book. Let's read that, his description of the chapters and his conclusion, and then we can talk about it a little more. In the first part of the book, I want to describe the relationship between philosophy and theories of labor in the 60s. In the wave of a Hegelian Renaissance and the constitution of critical theory, industrial labor was seen from the point of view of alienation and the rebellion of industrial workers against exploitation was seen as the beginning of a process of disalienation. In the second part of the book, I will account for the progressive mentalization of working processes and the consequent enslavement of the soul. Putting the soul to work, this is the new form of alienation. Our desiring energy is trapped in the trick of self-enterprise. Our libidinal investments are regulated according to economic rules. Our attention is captured in the precariousness of virtual networks. Every fragment of mental activity must be transformed into capital. I will describe the channeling of desire in the process of valorization and the psycho psychopathological implications of the subjugation of the soul to work processes. In the third part, I will retrace the evolution of several radical theories from the idealistic concept of alienation to the analytical concept of psychopathology. I will also compare the philosophy of desire, Deleuze and Guattari, with the philosophy of simulation, Baudelaire in order to underscore their differences, but also their complementarity. In the fourth part of the book, I will try to outline the effects of the precar precarization of labor, especially of cognitive labor, and the effects of the biopolitical subjugation of language and affections. In the con conclusion, I will commit comment on the current collapse of the integrated psychomachinic organism that is the global economy. The collapse of the global economy following the recent financial crack could be the opening of a new era of autonomy and em emancipation for the soul. So now we have the whole plan of the book. Okay, so the first part will focus on the peculiar history of the 60s, right? the workerist movement, but also of the process where labor in critical theory and in Hegelian neo-Renaissance was seen as 
being exploited and alienated, and then what is their response to that, their refusal to work, right, and the whole counterculture movement. But that's what he's going to discuss in the first part as something that reworks original Hegelian thought and Marx. Then in the second part, part of the book, what he's saying is that he will then account for the rise of cognitive labor, right? The process post-1980s in which labor becomes increasingly mentalized, capital becomes cognitive, and how in that process it's no longer our bodies but also our very souls, our consciousness that are at the beck and call of capital. How does cognitive capital emerge? How does it incorporate workers and people like us into its project, right? And every fragment of mental activity must be transformed into capital. Remember, that's very close to his definition of semi-capital. So in that, you know, He's also going to rely on theories of desire, right? The theories of psychopathology. So Deleuze and Guattari will figure very prominently in that discussion. And then he says, in the third part, I'll retrace the evolution of several radical theories. And this is where, you know, his thought becomes really, really revolutionary in a sense because of what he is trying to blend. So remember, Marxist thought, Hegelian thought, the rise of digital and cognitive capital, right? And then philosophies of desire. So that means since semi-capital works on a semiotic level and also incorporates our soul, we cannot just explain it in material terms. How does the soul get incorporated? So we will go to the philosophies of desire, you know, anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus, so Deleuze and Guattari and their rereading of Freud and Lacan, but also their theorization of schizophrenia. So that's going to play an important role. And then simulation and hyperreal, the concepts developed by Baudrillard, which are often considered irreconcilable. But what he's saying is, let's see if we can retrieve something from there. The purpose is to understand where capital is and what kind of labor is being incorporated in the project of capital and what is labor doing and how are our desires now incorporated, uh, totalized even, within the project of digital capital. And then he says, in the fourth part of the book, I'll try to outline the effects of the precarization. And that's a very important term, precarity. Right. So with the rise of intellectual labor, cognitive labor, digital capital, there has also been rise of gig economy, but also rise of the kind of workforce which is precarious, which has no protections, which has no unions, and which has to work from home, work in front of a computer with increasingly less chances of building solidarities. So in the fourth part then, after he discusses the philosophical and material causes of differences in how labor works, how soul is incorporated in its project, and how capital has become increasingly cognitive and digital, he's going to then discuss, you know, how precarity of labor plays a role in that. And this whole, you know, what he calls the psychomachinic organism, this global economy. Psychomachinic because it uh, incorporates our psyche, our consciousness. Machinic because it relies on computers and other technologies. And organism, of course, capitalism itself as an organism, that this global economy is. Right. So what we are getting then through this introduction is that this is a Marxist book, but it is not your average Marxist book, which is going to still talk about labor capitalist relation in material terms alone. The book is going to tell us where capital is. Right. And since it is at a certain place and has become psychomachinic, has become semi-capital, it, it incorporates our bodies and souls within its project in a different way. So if we are going to resist the power of capitalism, we have to understand what digital 
capital is. We have to understand what precarity is. We have to understand how our desires are incorporated within the project of capital. Only then can we mount a refusal to work, right? Now, as we read the book, you will learn, he will also tell us how this new system where our souls are constantly at call is also a sick system, right? Where everyone is relying on antidepressants and anxiety and fear are some of the biggest problems in this culture. But what he's going to tell us is, as we learn, that since in the material capital we only rented our bodies, now we are also renting our souls, right? There is no moment where we are not on call through this machine, right, called the cellular phone, uh, through email. And there are consequences of it that we are increasingly getting mentally ill, right? Hence, in accounting for the role of the hyperreal, the role of the power of simulacra in our life, the role of the internet, the role of the networks of power. So this is all that we get from the introduction, that the project will give us, the book will give us an understanding of how he understands Hegel, how he understands Marx, how is he differentiating between alienation and estrangement, then how is he infusing that knowledge with the knowledge of the 60s workerist movements, right, and the counterculture movement, or the labor strikes, then how is he then making, helping us understand where capital is, how has it become cognitive and digital, and if it has which theories, radical theories of desire and simulation, bodily end, right, can help us understand the precari precarity that this global machine of capital relies on. And then the last few sentences, this was written during uh, after the 2008 crisis, so maybe at that time Berardi was very hopeful and he was thinking maybe things will change. His latest work, of course, is not that hopeful, but that's where he ends the introduction. So that's all about the introduction. So remember, there are two videos on the introduction. This is part two, so please do watch part one. And this is a whole series that I'm developing, so I would be deeply grateful if you could send me your suggestions. Let me know what I missed in the comments. If you like it, then also please let me know. Give it a thumbs up or whatever you like. And stay with me, stay with us, and let's read this book carefully and talk more about it so that we have a body of knowledge that everyone can access and contribute to. So as always, thank you so much, and I will now see you next time as we delve into part one. Thank you so much. Stay safe. And as always, peace and love.